we have finally arrived at the final challenge in our first look at Cauchy sequences. We want to prove that every Cauchy sequence is convergent. In a previous lesson, we proved that convergent sequences are Cauchy, so after this, we will have proven that a sequence converges if and only if it is Cauchy. Let's waste no time and get right into the proof of this result. Of course, we need to start with an arbitrary Cauchy sequence and then prove it converges. So we'll say that AN is a Cauchy sequence. Now remember, one of the reasons that we started investigating Cauchy sequences is that we were looking for a way to prove that a sequence converges without knowing its limit. This, of course, is the key tool in being able to do that, that we could just prove a sequence is Cauchy, and then we'd be able to conclude it's convergent by this theorem. But at this point, of course, we don't know that's true. That's why we're doing the proof, which means we need to know what the limit of this arbitrary Cauchy sequence is. So what the heck could it be? What do we know about the sequence AN? Here's an important piece of information we know. We previously proved that Cauchy sequences are bounded, and I'll leave a link to that proof in the description. So, since AN is Cauchy, we can conclude it's bounded. Then, since AN is a bounded sequence, we can conclude something very important. By the balzano weierstrass theorem, since AN is bounded, it must have a convergent subsequence, which we could go ahead and call AN k and say that this converges to a limit of a. And again, that's by the balzano weierstrass theorem, which tells us every bounded sequence has a convergent subsequence. And I'll leave a link to my lesson proving it in the description. So now we have a limit a to work with. We know this subsequence of a n converges to a. So if a n converges to anything, it has to converge to a. You may recall that a sequence converges to a limit if and only if all of its subsequences also converge to that limit. So if a n is convergent, like we think, it's definitely converging to a. So let's try to prove that it converges to a. To prove that our Cauchy sequence a n converges to a, of course, it's going to go something like this. We'll let epsilon be greater than zero. There will be some details about setting a big n value. And then we'll have that for all terms of our sequence after the big nth term, those terms are within epsilon of the desired limit a and will be done. As we often do in these sorts of proofs, we're going to start with this expression, absolute value of a n minus a, and work towards trying to make it less than epsilon, and we'll be able to fill in the holes in the proof when we're done. You may recall a strategy we use pretty often when we have an absolute value of some subtraction. That strategy is to subtract and add the same thing inside this expression. When we do that, we're able to apply the triangle inequality theorem in order to split this expression across the addition and get something that's greater than or equal to it. So if we went through those steps, we'd have something like this. Optimally, of course, we want these two things to be things that we can control. Then all we would need to do is ensure that they are both less than epsilon over two, and then of course we would have that our desired expression is less than epsilon. Then the big question is, what's the squiggly thing? What do we subtract and add inside the absolute value expression so that this and this we can control? If you think about it a little bit, you might be able to come up with the key idea here. Here it is. Firstly, since a n is a Cauchy sequence, we can control the distance between terms of the sequence and other terms of the sequence. So in particular, by definition of a Cauchy sequence, we know there exists a natural number big N1, so that all terms of the sequence after the big N1th term are within epsilon over two of each other. But of course, some of the terms in our sequence after any point will be terms in our subsequence, which we know can converges to a. So we also know that there exists a natural number, say, big N2, so that any term of our subsequence after the big N2th term is within epsilon over 2 of a. 
So I'll just write that as a note up here. Remember that our subsequence a and k converges to a. Then all we have to do is this. Consider a term from our subsequence that is more than big N1 terms into the original sequence and more than big N2 terms into the subsequence. Such a term will have to be within epsilon over 2 of all terms of the original sequence after that big N1th term, and such a term will have to be within epsilon over 2 of the limit of the subsequence. Now, how can we pick out a term from our subsequence that is at least this far into both the original sequence and the subsequence? Well, we could let big N equal the maximum of big N1 and big N2. And then we can just consider the first term of the subsequence after the big Nth term. So consider A N big N plus one. So remember, this means it's the big N plus one term of our subsequence. Let me make sure it's clear why this will work. Since big N plus 1 is greater than big N, which since it's the maximum of N1 and N2, we know that big N is greater than or equal to N1. We'll start there. So this just means that the big N plus 1 term of our subsequence is past the big N 1 term of the subsequence. That much is obvious. The more specific detail we have to understand is that since this is past the big N 1th term of the subsequence, it's also past the big N 1th term of the original sequence. And so this inequality will apply to this term and any other terms of the original sequence after the big N 1th term. That's because of this fact that we've gone over a few times. For a subsequence A and K, each nk has to be greater than or equal to k. This means the kth term of the subsequence is at least k terms into the original sequence because each term of a subsequence has to be moving forward in the original sequence. So 10 terms into the subsequence, for example, has to be at least 10 terms into the original sequence. And then back to what we're talking about, if we're more than big N1 terms into the subsequence, we're also more than big N1 terms into the original sequence. So we'll be able to use this inequality with this specific term of the subsequence. And then the easier to understand understand part about this a n big n plus one is of course big n plus one is greater than big n which is greater than or equal to big n two again that's because big n is the maximum of big n one and big n two and so since we are more than big n two terms into the subsequence we know that this term must be within epsilon over two of the limit because every term of the subsequence after the big n tooth term is within epsilon over two of the the limit. And so this, my friends, is what our squiggle should be. And this is the key to our proof. We'll subtract and add a n big N plus one, the specific term of the subsequence that's far long enough in both the original sequence and the subsequence to make some magic happen. All right, I have replaced our squiggles. Now notice, as we had before, we're considering all terms of the sequence a n after the big nth term, where big N is as we just defined it. So now everything will work out. We begin as usual with the distance between terms of the sequence and the desired limit. Then we subtract and add this particular term of the subsequence, which of course is also a term of the original sequence that we know is gonna be useful. Since we subtract and add it, we haven't changed the value at all. Then we apply the triangle inequality theorem across this addition. So we have that this is less than or equal to this. Here, our definition of Cauchy comes into play because these are two terms of the sequence past the big N one term, we know that the absolute value of their difference is less than epsilon over two. And then this absolute value expression makes use of our subsequence converging. Since this is a term of the subsequence after the big N tooth term, the distance between it and the limit 
is less than epsilon over 2. And so their sum is less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2, which of course is epsilon. And so we found a big n value so that every term of our sequence, a n, after the big nth term is within epsilon of the limit. Thus, a n, our arbitrary Cauchy sequence, converges. So every Cauchy sequence converges. I'm not going to bother rearranging all of this stuff I wrote out into exactly how it would appear in a proof, but the arrangement would be roughly like this. You would start as we did with this statement here. Then you don't have to, but you might choose to state that we want to prove this, just to give the reader some direction of where we're headed. We would then take epsilon greater than zero, and then we would insert these remarks, how we know that this big N1 exists and this big N2 exists. Remember, this is because our sequence AN is Cauchy. This is because our subsequence ANK converges to A. Then you would set big N equal to this maximum and consider AN big N plus one. You would then have, for all terms of AN after the big Nth term, all of this good stuff. And so we have proven that every Cauchy sequence is convergent, and this combined with our proof that every convergent sequence is Cauchy has now established that convergent and Cauchy sequences are the same thing. A sequence is Cauchy if and only if it converges. Get a good down and need a good